the right place. Exactly. Thank God. A view on the world. <laughs> so, here we are again. Um, so I already noticed that some discussions start to to go in the outside. Um, the idea of this of this uh, moment is, in fact, I, I asked a few of the quartets uh, in the school during the last weeks if there are some kind of fundamental questions about quartet playing, about rehearsing, about <coughs> how to get along, how to make an interpretation, how to interpret historical uh, information, how to deal with pragmatism, practice method. Um, I asked them to, to give me these questions, and what I did is to make some kind of resume, some kind of, of uh, uh, thematic division of, of what could be problems in a quartet. Um, I have four uh, aspects. I have practice method, I have interpretation and musical identity. I have also the question how to deal with conflicts or, or with the kind of <coughs> internal balance between the personalities. And then also an important one is, is how, how to start or how to organize as a young quartet. How do you want to become a real quartet? And at this, this point, maybe you can immediately make a connection. I was outside with the ANSI quartet, as I called them. <laughs> um, is there a difference between a student quartet and a professional quartet? It's a fairly modern idea to have a student quartet. I don't, I'm not sure that I know of any historical evidence for quartets being trained in conservatoires. A quartet was usually started by one or two important people, mm. <laughs> led by a notable person like Josef Joachim or Arnold Rosé or Capet, um, um, or, or, or because of an institution like the Gewandhaus Quartet. And so whoever was the top dog at the Gewandhaus would be the leader of the quartet, Ferdinand David, for many years. And even when he played the viola, which he liked to do sometimes, he was the leader on the viola. <laughs> yeah. How is it for, for, for you guys? Because it's, like, as we see, it's, it's very often difficult because they were speaking about the change in the quartet, a change of member, eh? what you said, mm. never throw out one if mm. three. And it's something we, we see, and I guess you also see it in the school, when we speak about student quartets, that, that it's very difficult to keep them well, unified and together. And, and well, we were just talking about this, and I was saying that uh, I was very, very fortunate with my quartet because we were invited to go to Boston, to New England Conservatory. And they have a quartet program there where what, every year, or for or four, two years actually it is normally, they have one quartet who are in residence, and they... I mean, it's extraordinary how valuable, how they value it. They pay for everything. They pay for your flat. I mean, extraordinary. And so we didn't have, we didn't have to do orchestra. We didn't have to do anything. So we would have these ridiculously long eight-hour rehearsals. Can you imagine? And, we, and that was when the doors were being slammed um, in the rehearsals. But that foundation of one year of slow intonation of just building up the, you know, the fundaments and finding where we stood on things. That, I'm afraid, was, I say I'm afraid because it's so difficult to find that situation. Um, that was crucial for us, and I think that's one of the biggest problems for young quartets that they need to address, is how on earth do we do this so that every third quartet rehearsal is not being cancelled because so-and-so has a gig? You know, modern modern problems um, and that you should I, I, I'm not providing an answer but I'm just saying that I think that's a bigger problem than some people realize and that one should be trying desperately to, to find answers to I think the best way to spend holidays is to, to be with the quartets playing new repertory because it's impossible Maybe. to avoid gigs nowadays and also I think you you have the feeling now that it's important to have a net so when you have a proposal to accept it so my proposal is to spend all your holidays time together, eating spaghetti together at lunchtime, and maybe uh, blanquette de veau on the night. <laughs> but uh, it's true that in a week of practice, not one year, but in a week of practice together, sleeping on the rehearsals, maybe careful about the telephone, I'm sorry to speak about, but it's a big distraction. 
And then you will have the same amount of, I would say, experience and memory of the practice done in 20 rehearsals spread off in two months. But in a way, when you say you go to Boston as a quartet or Daniel went to Obra, I think when you make the decision to do that, you decided to be a quartet, like not just a student quartet. Mm. So maybe that's a kind of student pre-professional and professional quartet. I don't know if that's... that's a what makes to make that decision? Well, exactly. Someone outside, is it gone? No, he's not here. Asked me, where d how do you know that, this, that these three people are, are sort of, that it's working no. well enough? <laughs> and I said to him, do you have a girlfriend? He said, yes, I do. She was standing right there next to him. I said, so, when did you decide that it was worth being in a relationship with each other? You know, it's, a jokes aside, it's, it's how on earth do you answer that question? It's the same thing, human interaction. Um, it's very, it can get more complicated with quartets, but uh, uh, you try, right? It's a, it's a part of your human nature. You, you try and make things work. But I, I also think uh, that as, a, uh, as we organize a master class with some maestro, we, I, hope, I think we hope some quartets will improve, but we killed a lot of quartets also. <laughs> because when they arrived with seven hours of practice and a little concerts to do in a elderly house to, to participate in the costs, someone said suddenly, no, it's too much for me. So also, that's a problem when we don't have occupation and goals, it's very difficult if you should stay, no to, to uh, sorry, to know if you should stay together and you, if you have the same motivation competition because it was a question concerts and residency tell us if you are able to work together and to stay together and people have different natures don't they some people really know are very sure and by nature they're able to commit to things very easily and other people need uh, are a little bit more hesitant and and i would say well look just what can i get out of this situation what can i learn you know any day any rehearsal spent in a quartet with a score with three other people, you're going to come out richer for it. So you can also view it in that way to a, to a degree that there is nothing that can be negative about this experience. Might it be useful to know that like a functioning quartet is like 50% of the quality is the playing quality of the members and 50% is like how they managed to organize the thing around and to I must say when I when I maybe you don't know when I joined the Daniel Quartet uh, I was 22 years old and the first year I was like <laughs> playing quartet amazing great and and after one year I remember in Festival de Luberon I had the kind of oh my god this is tough you know because I, I the first year was like oh playing and then start to get through a few politesse how you say politeness yeah and then you see that, that there is the aspect you spoke of before, that there is the kind of human aspect. I wonder if there is a way that these student quartets could learn to deal with that immediately from the start. I don't know. Do you think it's valuable for a quartet to be a group of equals, or do you think it's valuable to have one dominant person in a quartet? Good question. <laughs> because that happens quite a lot. Well, it's 2022. We live in an age of democracy. What did Winston Churchill say? <laughs> you know, de democracy is the worst form of government, except for everything else. Yes. So, so in a quartet, definitely when I was growing up, so to speak, uh, beginning with, in my quartet, 2002, that was, it was very much the age of, uh, of democratic relationships, and there was no boss, absolutely not. And my goodness, it took a long time. Whew. But to, 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 find, to find ideas together. But um, I think it was worth it. You know, I mean, I don't, why do you join a quartet if not to be creative? Mm -hmm. But I also think you should accept to lose part, yeah. I mean, in the external picture of your identity. And when you play a classical romantic program, very often I remember you are in the green room and some person comes, push you after the concert, where is your first violin? Yeah. So, and also you are not a cellist, you are the member, you are the cellist of the Daniel Quartet. So you should accept it and consider why you accept this. But it's true that the personal 
I would say, shining is also given to the, I mean, the reputation and the image of the quartet. If you need to have a kind of more uh, shiny, uh, shining uh, image, or uh, you should not do quartet. <laughs> I mean, maybe first violin, but stay, uh, stop with Brahms. Then you can have still this kind of primarius, as we've said in the past, primarius. Uh, how, how was that historically? I, I remember seeing some pictures with Vieux standing and the three others sitting, and then yes. later the cellist on a podest and the second violin and the viola still sitting. Yeah, yeah I think how the image that you, that's in the London Illustrated News when he was playing quartets in London, and he sits on a very high stool yeah. and the others are on normal right. chairs. Uh, but the cellist is on a little platform, but that, that's yeah. only to bring him up to the level of the others, I think. Okay. Yeah. And for resonance, probably. Yeah, as well. And why do you think that, it, that this, this kind of, like you said, I think we can see a clear evolution in, in quartet history where we had quartets where the name of the quartet was always, I don't know, Joachim Quartet yeah. or, or Ferdinand David or Böhm or, or Heinsberger yeah, or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then some, at some moment we have some, now we have quartets, well, yeah, you have a third violinist name. Well, that's a different case, but many quartets have no more personal names. <laughs> that's true. That's very true. So yeah. I, don't, I mean, the change is obviously a 20th century thing. Up till that point, they were usually associated with one yeah. leading person. And Schuppensieg, certainly, for instance. They didn't really officially get called the Schuppensieg Quartet. They mm. were known, I think, as the Schuppensieg. <coughs> and he okay. certainly led it, and he stamped his foot for the tempos. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's okay. really the occasion to speak about the Pro Arte Quartet, because they're in Belgium. And I think in the way of dealing with the career, it was on the first, one of the first modern quartets. Because first of, of all, the name was a yeah. kind of a ID, and not a name of one of the member. And I think it was really a very, very good team. And uh, extremely good quartet. I advise you to search recordings of the Pro Arte Quartet. It's uh, astonishing. You have to know that Stravinsky said you are the only one to understand my music when they played the three pieces. And the fourth quartet of Bartok is dedicated to them, mm. Belgian quartet, mm. still alive because during the still alive during the war they moved to America, and they recently had the birthday of their I mean their hundredth birthday. <laughs> I have a, a question of the Quiron quartet, which we will see tonight. Um, while rehearsing in quartet, is it beneficial to change methodologies frequently to get a more complete approach and a better result? Now, what, what I like of today is that we have three lectures that are very different. We have a kind of historical approach with, with a lot of knowledge and, and, and basing on, 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 on historical stories. Yeah? And we have the pragmatic way of, of making a system of a quartet. And I, I don't know, I could say a more poetic way of speaking about ideas and interpretation, how can a young quartet find its way in this, in, in, in these different aspects of, of finding the unity? Well, I, I, I would say that understanding what the notation was meant to convey is one of the most important things, and it's one of the least considered things today. Because we read the notation with 21st century eyes, um, and those eyes see something utterly different than well, middle of the 20th century, you only need to listen to recordings, and you can hear that they were seeing different things in the notation. Go further back, um, and the, the more different it becomes, because the notation is m more precise at the beginning of the 20th century than it was half a century before that and half a century before that. And you had to make many more decisions. So when we play the great classical works, the composers and their contemporaries would not recognize what we do they would not consider that to be the music as they understood it. Now, this is a big challenge, because we live in the modern world, and there are certain things that are expected of a musician when they perform. But if we, we pay lip service very often to the notion of being faithful to the composer's intentions, but what we do is not faithful to the composer's intentions. So there's a big kind of issue there to be considered. Yeah. And then, as an individual, how do you... How do you turn that knowledge, if you travel that route, into something that is personal and true to you, to your identity? Because every musician yeah. in the 18th century was a, an individual. Mm -hmm. And 
and that's some, I, mean, I, I remember I had a, a student at, at the Mozarteum. She cost me gray hairs everywhere. She was she she had such a strong personality, and would and it was a mess. It was sorry sorry wherever you are, it was but it was so individual. It was wonderful, but it was had nothing to to do with anything that I could really understand. And I was very cautious and I was very nervous about I don't want to say imposing, but I was I was scared of chain of helping of pushing her in too far away from her course because she had such conviction. She was such an interesting person. And, but then at some point I just thought, no, come on, William, for goodness sakes, you've got a job. It's your responsibility. If she wants to study with you, then she has decided to trust you and to, to, to learn what you've got to say. And so I felt she cannot leave this institution without having had a Baroque bow in her hand, without having sat down and learned about base, certain basic principles of, of, of playing the repertoire from the, back then, which at, at the stage when I was listening to her for the first time, you couldn't hear any acknowledgement of, of, of certain stylistic um, norms and practices. Um, but I, did have the, I felt that I had that job, and so I tr tried to sort of provide her with a, a so-called basic education, um, and then... A, but try to nonetheless allow her to, to still be Ariana. Uh, and, um, but I think there's always going to be a period where you're feeling like you're swimming a little bit as a student. There's going to be a period where you've learnt a huge amount, hopefully from the right person in the right way. You know, only study with someone who you want to study with. You know, you have to actually believe in you have to have a decision, I want to study with this person. Well, why? You know, it has to have a... Um, and then I think after you leave that person, I know for myself, there was a moment where I was... I always had that teacher, a couple of teachers, whispering in my ear, saying, no, 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 no. At, when I was doing something, ah, damn it, you know. And it took a while for, until I was, A, able to really separate myself from that teacher and say, okay, I'm not going to go for advice anymore. I, I need to get up on the stage. I need to stand here. And I need the, the, what I've learned to sort of stew and become part of me, become part of my DNA. And it, and it takes time. And maybe it's 10 years. You know, maybe it's a, a really a period after you finish studying where you feel insecure, and, but you're finding your identity and... And I, th I hope that that, in a way, answers mm -hmm. to an extent that this question about, mm -hmm. also about methodology and, and about what you were mentioning about this fundamental knowledge and interest. Mm -hmm. I, it's not an easy thing, and you don't, the, the subjects will carry on going for years. The question yeah. also is, I, I was, last week I told you during the break, discussing with the quartet, <coughs> about the information we had and, and the recordings and the Klingner Quartet and, and it's true when a young quartet listens to that and, and goes into this let's say historical performance practice um, if we would choose now to play like Josef Joachim maybe it's very interesting because then we know for, for which sound or which type of playing Brahms wrote for example yeah. but at the same time if we do it now I experienced it from my side professionally. I don't always like it, <laughs> very simply. And, and that's sometimes very difficult because it's very far away from what we expect now. And I, I'm very often in juries and I, I don't speak certainly badly of my colleagues, but I'm sure if a quartet would play like the Klingler Quartet plays the, the, the Mozart, I think some of my colleagues might get very upset. Yeah I, don't, yeah, I don't think you could do that. I think that's mm. not what, what, it, what it's about, really. But it's about learning the messages behind the notation and then interpreting mm. them as musicians who have grown up yeah. with what we've grown up with. Um, but what it does, it seems to me, which is vitally important for, for young musicians, and I'm sure that it's the way things are going to develop, is that we learn to reuse a lot of t practices and techniques that were used, but we use them in our own ways, mm. And we now expand our repertoire of what we can do expressively, um, way beyond what we're doing at present. And we can do it with the confidence that this 
was something that they expected you to do. For instance, I mean, I noticed with all the recordings you, that were played of modern performances, everything was rhythmically exact. All the equal notes were played equally. Um, if, if not, it was so imperceptible, it wasn't noticeable to me. Um, all the dotted rhythms were played tum, 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 tum. Could count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, to every single one. That's unhistorical. It wasn't expected. And it spoils the music for my ears. Mm. Um, the fact that one uses uh, a prominent uh, vibrato, particularly in the cello, in the case we, we, we heard on the beginning of the Beethoven, Opus 59, number two, slow movement, mm. for me destroyed completely that feeling of serenity and, and beauty. This unpleasant wobble <laughs> which changes, which affects the, uh, the, the harmony, which is one of the biggest problems. I mean, you, you, you hear it most, most shockingly these days in the opera. When you go to a Mozart opera and you have the singers all going wobbling it, and sometimes as much as a semitone in different directions in an ensemble, you can no longer hear the harmony. Do you think there is a way to, to connect these two things, what, what, what Guy tried to, to show us? And I think many of the very good quartets for the moment, our generation of quartets and, 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 and also younger quartets uh, are extremely good. When I say extremely good, it's a technical level. Uh, the work you, you did on Shostakovich is, is a kind of start to, to, to have this kind of extreme control in playing together and unifying. And then, like you said, afterwards, make a step away from this to, to create a personality. Do you think that, that this approach and th that approach, there is a way to connect it? Please. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go. <coughs> I say, please uh, find a way to connect them. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, well, I will feel bad. <laughs> my experience is that it can very easily be done. I work with a lot of young quartets, and I encourage them to do this, which is not what's on the page, but it's a historical practice. And so we have modern playing, but using historical means. Yeah. Um, and and the, the other thing, the other major thing, which we are totally ignoring in modern practice, is the Fortimento. It was there in Mozart's time, and Haydn's time. Yeah, Haydn even notates it sometimes. And yet we don't do it. We, we resist that, because in the 1930s, it suddenly became taboo to use it. And everyone says, this is terrible, bad taste. We must stop doing it. It's like the spreading of chords on the piano. Um, but those were the historic, historical practices. They were expected by the composers. They were envisaged by the composers. Sometimes the composers, if they were string players, would write in the fingerings to show you where to do it. But mostly they didn't. They just expected you to know where you should do it. And when we play that music without those techniques and practices, we're, 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 we're producing something less interesting than we could do if we start to use them again. But you think we should try to search for the same kind of, let's say, control in a group. I don't know if control or, or skill, maybe, in the group. If you say, like, the, the, the dotted rhythms or the triplets, or it's like yeah. the thing, should we like to measure it? No, and absolutely to do it not. Like, or should we really go from the idea well, you know, that I mean, this portato in the first violin is doing it, but the viola yeah. is not? Well, we, Even we, if they are doing, we do, do it still together. enjoy the way that, for instance, uh, really good jazz players play mm -hmm. without being perfectly together, doing interesting things all the time and exciting things, we maybe should train ourselves to expect that in classical music because without it, for my ears and my perceptions after all the things I've done and learned over the years, mm -hmm. it's, it's lacking something. It's uninteresting to me because it's so regular, it's so predictable, and one performance, that, I mean, of course there are differences, but one performance is so like another that it's not a very interesting experience. The other thing is that we have, um, and which I think is equally important, is that we have narrowed our repertoire down to what has been considered over a period of time as the great music. And it is great music, there's no question about that. But we also ignore a lot of music which is as great or nearly as great Sometimes it's as great, sometimes it's not, but then so sometimes Beethoven is not as interesting as he is on other occasions. And, and, and our repertoire has become so narrow that it's really killing the, the, the excitement of new experience for people. We, 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 I mean, to, to be honest, and, and we think about the audiences, new music is not very interesting to most people, and they don't want to come to concerts to hear it. Um, in the 
18th and 19th century, they didn't want to hear old music. They wanted to hear new music all the time. We could, in our classical music world, in our traditional classical music world, give them that experience again by broadening our repertoires. But I, I join you. I remember when we practiced the Beethoven Quartet with Walter Levin, he always mentioned in the score you find information that well-informed musicians didn't know. And for that, of course, we are supposed to know the, the tradition and what people knew from their education. Yeah. Yeah. And surely on the time where people were more, have had more time to be well-educated than now. But also, I think for young quartet, we need to find the, this knowledge easily because practitioners have no time to make this research. Yeah. Yeah. It's why they should really find library where they can find and choose, because there could be several proposal and interpretation of the lecture done. But for that, it's very important that you, you find, and the schools are here, or the library for that, to find the books that they could consider as a shortcut for finding their place. I have a very interesting question connected to this. In the age of digital recordings, which are <laughs> extremely convenient and accessible, how do you recommend a new group to balance external influences and internal input? <clears throat> I mean, if I listen to a recording, I might dislike it intensely. Wonderful. I now know, maybe, more clearly what it is that I do value. What I, and I don't, I mean, does anyone actually copy recordings? Does anyone do that? I don't. I think a lot of young people do do that. Really? But there, is, there is a Dutch <laughs> Why? Uh, viola player who did a PhD. He, he tried to write exactly down the way of playing what the Klingler Quartet did and some other uh, very old recordings. And they tried to really copy it to the extreme and then play it in concerts and see what the, what the reactions were. Um, my knowledge goes until there. I don't know how it <laughs> was. I, I wanted to invite him also to be here today, but uh, but I mean, but it's it's. I, I mean, it it is a question because if you like I said before yep. with the Brahms Second Quartet, if we look in the 20th century, Amadeus, Albanberg, Belcea, you have very good young quartets, and you go back to to Budapest and Klingla and so on. I mean, it's so different, and I can imagine for a student. It's not too easy to find its way in this and, and I mean, make I your own personal input. In this. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, read, I like to read books and I like to disagree with what's written. I like to listen to recordings occasionally and disagree. The recordings we heard were all dead quartets, Bush quartet, vague quartet. Um, I find instinctively I don't like listening to living quartets, with one exception. Um, and, but I'm not going to say who, it doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's good laugh. Um, but, but fundamentally, I've never, ever, I've enjoyed listening to a quartet and thinking, oh, this tempo feels, somehow I like it. I'd like to dance to that. But anything more detailed than that, I've never felt it was any way useful. I was, everyone is brought up in a different way and learns in different ways, but um, what does the harmony tell us? How many, how many harmonies are there per bar? How dissonant is it? How consonant is it? Schubert isn't next door. I can't ask him. What does forte mean? Who knows? There are billions of fortes. Who knows what andante means? It, it, it's such a crude notation and uh, not their fault it's uh, the notation is very very crude to a great extent there are certain basics that we can do but it is at a certain level i think it's um the sort of the truth if you like that i know or feel that i can trust mostly is what is the harmony saying to me and as kurtag talks very beautifully about being that harmony, about allowing your entire presence, your body, your mind, your soul, to become G major. And how does that feel compared with E flat major or C minor? And I think if you, we have 
develop a sensitivity, a sensibility for the harmonies and really take the time to stop how does A flat major feel in this context. That is a, acknowledges the personal element and it acknowledges also um, what's really at the heart of the piece. And I think the harmonies are, are the thing that I can, that I can trust most. I think one of the problems is, that is, is actually what we're doing now, which is talking about music, because talking about music is never adequate to actually make it's you like understand what it Raul feels Davara, like. He recently died, by the way. He, he, I remember when we were in Kuchmo saying, uh, speaking about music is like dancing about architecture. Yeah, yeah, so exactly that. I like that one. <laughs> so in the end, it does come down to your sensitivity as a musician, what you feel. And that sensitivity is built up and determined by what you experience. I mean, it isn't, it is, we aren't, we don't come like Athene out of the head of Zeus, you know, with all that knowledge in us. We acquire it from what, what we experience. And that's the, what, what I was talking about this morning, about the difference between richtiger Vortrag and schöner Vortrag, correct and beautiful performance, that Anybody can learn richtiger Vortrag, which is to do what's on the page as precisely and perfectly as possible. But schöner Vortrag, and, and, and for instance, Hummel and Spohr both speak about this and say that it can really only be understood by hearing the greatest performers. <laughs> and of course, the greatest performers of the past are dead to us before we get Joachim and, and Co. Um, and they would have been the first people to say, don't copy what I do, learn from what I do, but don't copy it. Um, but they were great performers. Um, I still maintain that I've, if I look back over my studies, I'm not sure how, and this is, I'm sure this is my fault, but I'm not sure how much I've learnt by listening to others. Maybe I have, on I some subconscious, yes, it's a subconscious, subconscious level. level. But if I, when I sit down as an adult, like these guys here, and think, mm -hmm. okay, what do I want here? Who am I? What do I think of these pieces? That, that stage, I, I definitely stopped learning from listening. And maybe I was listening to the wrong people. I think you've got a list of things that, I, that we should all listen to and, and, and think about and talk about. But again, I think I come back to what does C minor feel like? Um, what does that do to me? And, why has, and what's the composer in his structures? Things that are maybe a little bit more objective as well. How is, where's the joke? Where's the extension? Why is this phrase 10 bars long and not eight? Where, why have I been knocked off balance? And why, you know, these things that are a bit more objective, but we need to be able to, we need to have the knowledge to identify what's the joke, where's the skill. And I loved the fact that you talked about how our repertoire has become so small because I feel that we have no idea why is Opus 18 number one so incredible. Because, and, and if we lived our lives listening a bit more to Dittersdorf, with all due respect, <laughs> we would begin to realize much more, I think, yeah, yeah. why is Mozart utterly incredible and so much better, light years ahead. But you'd also, you'd also discover, in many cases, wow, why don't we hear this music anymore? Mm. Because there is some very great music written by people we don't hear. Uh, the, the three Dussek string quartets. Have you ever heard anybody no. play them? Mm. It's wonderful music. It, and that's great music, actually. And there's, there's many more like that. And, 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 or you listen to some of Anton Ranitsky's quartets written also for Lobkowitz at the same time that Beethoven wrote the Opus 18. Okay. They may not be Beethoven, yeah. but you listen to them in the right way and they have many wonderful features in them. And when we speak about CD, I... I have to say that sometimes I advise quartets when they start a quartet, I mean person of a long-term project, not to listen to CDs anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, also because I think we should consider especially young quartets. Why? Because nowadays, uh, for me, a quartet recording, it's a, it's a quintet. And the sound engineer, the artistic director, is so important and has such big influence on the recording and uh, I think it's very clear for us that when you are an actor, if you play for a theater or for the cinema, it's not the same. That's very clear in the school. You can work both or also specialize you. And there's very good actors for cinema which are very bad for uh, theater. And I try myself to learn more the idea of being on stage. 
And I will advise to go to concerts because we'll get a main impression which gives some feelings, some strong and deep message. And also the recording sometimes is heard in a very bad condition. So where our attention is not there. And also it's a, it's a picture of one moment and which doesn't represent any true. Mm. And also I think all the quartets, and surely it happens to you, when you f finish a recording, your first wish, very difficult to organize, is to record it again. <laughs> so, uh, and it was our I project. Don't open the CD. Yeah, don't, but don't it's, uh, it. <laughs> it's uh, I, I feel always very bad yeah. after recording. Yeah. Say, ah, it's what we've done, but we missed a lot of things. Yeah. So I think it's very important to be able to read the score carefully, as you've done, with proper information. But my advice when you start to work a piece is to f not listen, maybe to listen to operas of Mozart, mm. if you play a Mozart quintet. Because, for example, some quartets, I, I think in, in Cosi Fan Tutte, you have such a strong aspect of chamber music in a lot of uh, harmonies, uh, stuff. And, uh, mm. uh, so my advice would maybe to, to listen to music surrounding the composer, but not the piece you are studying. Mm. And also because it's extremely, there is a lie, I'm sorry to say, behind recordings. When I say a lie, it's very better than what mainly the people are able to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, and and, and w one of the things that recording has really um, produced in the last half century is this assumption that everything has to be perfectly together ah. in a vertical sense. And that is actually damaging to the music in many, many ways. The pianists in the 19th century and into the 20th century played most chords not together. Now, so if you play a trap piano trio with a pianist, you're already, <laughs> in that way, the vertical is sy the synchrony is already um, partly destroyed. String quartets, too. I mean, I, I gave a quotation this morning about Joachim playing um, in very free way above a regular accompaniment. Um, that, was, that was part of the way that they expected the music to and be. I don't know, I in the orchestra of the five. Yes, yes, yeah. the, uh, yeah, the yeah. first violin to, oh, sorry. Mm. To escape from the quartet. Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah. What and we, we, we deny ourselves these yeah. things because well, partly because the recording engineers get terribly upset if you're not perfectly together. Yeah. Which I think is very complicated to play nowadays for young yeah, yeah. quartets. Yeah. But you saw, when you spoke about jazz, a swing is a swing. You shouldn't play the the the, the way it's written. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, it's but that was that was true of classical music. Yeah, yeah, but it's but we don't do it anymore. It's we where we need books, you know. Yeah, and yeah, you yeah. know, uh, uh, writing in the yeah. classical time for the null, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But if, it, you know, you get you get jazz which has been written out, which it is, and it's yeah. not written out the way that it's played. Exactly. And you do it, and somebody would say, "Well, that's that's completely wrong." It's the same with yeah, Beethoven and Mozart. Are there questions about <laughs> this? Would be really nice to have. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, no. But just to go a bit back from the sum topic, uh, about the quartet, when you know that it's your quartet and you should push it forward. Because like at the conservatory, we are students and we are independent on the professors when we are here. And there, I'm, I'm sorry for my groups, but I, I do love you, but I'm not <laughs> talking about anything, anyone specific. But uh, there is groups that I truly love, but then I talk with professors and professors are like, no. That like, I, they don't see the future for the group. And they're like, think about it, be mindful, and then see. And then there is groups that I really don't like. I don't want to play with them, with those people. And the professors are like, keep it, good group. Like, what to do in this situation? <laughs> like, no, because like, if the group is like four people that really are not enjoying being in one room, but it works. We can play together. But then there is a group that's, that everyone loves, and then it's like... Do you believe your teacher? <laughs> 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 I, I no, I say that slightly provocatively in the sense of a, a group that has been, de has been given the stamp of approval, this is good. My question might be, uh, for how long? Mm. Yeah, but also, like, we take so many lessons with different professors, different people, master classes, everything, and then it's like, 
just different opinions. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like ultimately, well, you definitely know one thing has been established. You have to decide yeah. because no one else can agree. Okay? So you need to have a lot of confidence to understand that, which as students is difficult sometimes, I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the question might be that, as I said, the group that has been deemed to be successful, uh, as I said, for how long? We don't know. You can know that more easily than an outsider. The third question might be the difficult group. Is difficult always something that you want to get rid of? Is there something intrinsically, artistically, possibly good? So I'm, I'm, I'm going at it at both sides, I'm, uh, because of course this is a hypothetical in my situation. It might be that you, the advice you've been given is incredibly good. It might be incredibly bad. But, but don't, when you're trying to decide, don't rule out the long-term picture, that journey, and what it might feel like. Is that too vague? There is it? also is a question of... Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm just wondering if that's going to leave you unsatisfied because it's too vague. No. I'm just saying that it's a complex thing and take um, in maybe to account more things than, mm -hmm. than you might be thinking about. Mm -hmm. But just like for me, it's like I trust that professor or whoever we play that they see something more. Like mm. they don't see something, uh, yeah. I don't know, for the future that maybe we don't see. So I would like to trust that, that mindset. Also. But you, I think that's also a question of perception, how you live a situation, or maybe very often inside a string quartet, small problems that can create a lot of tension and a situation in which you feel the perception, this is like dramatic, and then when you play in a concert or an exam in a big hall and there is a small jury sitting from a distance that the perception for them is very different and is very different in a lesson also. And I think what, what, what William says, I mean, trust yourself in this more than, than your teacher, I would say, or colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we have plenty of recordings, plenty of older, like you said on your lecture that there are quartets with 40 years of experience, there are quartets of 20 years experience, and there are quartets like we are like with one year experience or less. And we are thinking about like getting to this full market, I think, like of, of string quartet. Is it like, is it worth it? Like, will there be a need for new quartets as we have seen so plenty of different quartets? I, I would say that there's a need for new quartets if they'll new, do new things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Present that music in a different way and you'll get the attention of the public. But uh, also I think you should, do, you should do what you have to do and I will refer to Lettre en Jeune Poète from Rilke, Letter to a Young. If you need it, do it. If you don't need it, don't do it. Also, I think because we live in a very protected context and ourselves with Eric, we try to organize concerts everywhere. And I would make a short calculation. We are 10 milliards in the world. Maybe 1 milliard of people listen to classical music. Maybe, sorry, 5 million milliard can't listen to music because their situation is too difficult. So there is 3 milliards left. So just move, go, go on the market go in the little mediation centrum, go in churches, go in temple, and please help us to resist to demagogy. Also, very pragmatically, uh, there are different, I, d I don't like to talk about it in this way, but a concert presenter can employ, engage a young quartet for X thousands euros, and a middle-aged quartet for a bigger sum of money and a, for a very big sum of money. And I just want to say with that, uh, there are many more concerts to be had when you're, w when you're one or two or three years old and have had some success. It's very pragmatic. And also, people get so excited about youth, about the energy of a young quartet doing what they need to do and what they believe, you know, what they believe in. So I think this is the best advice, and also pragmatically, don't, 
you know, fight your fight for the right reason. Don't um, shut the door before it's, you know. As I say, there are always young quartets coming out. They're cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's why we can go to some other subjects. Don't go direct to an agent. Because there is a very big agency with 20 quartets. And if you go to Renault, and if you are well-dressed, they will propose you, uh, I don't know the name of the cars, but the best uh, big car with climatization, everything. Nevada. No, Nevada. No. <laughs> Private joke. <laughs> and uh, then you will say, yes, but I need, uh, I, 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 I'm in the city, I need a li more little car, and then my neighborhood is not very simple. So you will leave the house with the Clio, and they will say, the car for you. So it's uh, sometimes the same in big agency that you are the, at the top, the end of the list, and they just send you to little concerts, which are very important for you, but that you can organize yourself. There was a wonderful society uh, in the past, uh, GIF AOL. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's in Germany. Yeah, it was organized by Zellheim. And he did organize 200 concerts in Germany in little places. And he was invited to quartet for one week. You were paid sometimes just 500 marks or 1,000 marks, which is not a lot. But you had four or five concerts in a week. And then you came with some money and also with a lot of experience. So I think it's why you should be kind of an uh, entre entrepreneur to organize yourself at to start. And there is a lot of place, so some organizer, but Belgium is a little country that's more difficult because we are always under the influence of a big city. Mm. And there is also a new fashion, please resist to it. Ah, you want to be known, come freely for us and play. And we have to fight against this sometimes. And I do not accept young people to play for nothing. A part of, if there is really no money. I mean, if you go for elderly people, why not? It's your generosity, it's your choice. But you should really resist to this offer from big festival. And it happens once, three years ago, there was a festival who received money from the state to let young musicians play, but the young musicians didn't get one penny. So be careful. But so be your own organizer. Try little association. Uh, think local. We are in the time of the low food, low everything. So uh, short market, you say, <coughs> it works. It works, maybe not to make your living, but to have sufficient uh, enough of an opportunity to go on and um, maybe to, to be able to make the quartet playing part of your organization, uh, financial organization. And I mean, you've got this far. If you've decided, if you've made it into this building, um, there's a part of you which is, has anyway already decided or accepted that you're doing this for a, something very important inside you, a, a, a love or a need, and that, I mean, not to be crude, but you're not going to get rich. You know, if you, uh, I mean, I don't know, I think the idealism, the fight, you can feel, as Guy is slightly mentioning, you can feel also that you're fighting for something for culture. It, uh, it's a sort of political statement as well. And I think young people have an energy about them which is so inspiring and so f powerful. And it can be a political fight, it can be a fight for some kind of bigger value. And if you can grasp to something there, I think you, you're, you're on the winning track, you know. Don't be too pragmatic. I, <coughs> I had a question, it was not on, on the little list. If you have to name five Quartets from the repertoire, from Haydn to I don't know to most contemporary piece for a beginning quartet. What would you advise? For a beginning quartet. For a beginning, four students come together. What what do they play? It Sorry. depends on the time they have. <laughs> okay, <laughs> to stay pragmatic. First of all, how present you think should be the contemporary music? Should there be a balance between what exists or should we go focus on Haydn quartets and Mozart because that's easy? I 
don't think they're easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't think they're necessarily easy, but they are. They have a clarity yeah. Yeah. to them, which can, which of course lends itself to learning, mm -hmm. to learning the gestures, to learning the harmonic patterns and structures, more than a complex yeah. modern piece. Uh, you know, a Haydn. Uh, uh, Haydn, of course, is always going to be your first port of call, I think. Mm -hmm. I can advise 20 quartets, and it's too much and not enough. But uh, I would propose to look at contemporary music because when Cliff spoke about the writing, when you have the occasion to practice a contemporary piece, especially with a living composer, you understand that it's very difficult to write music. Mm. So uh, I will really advise to go to new music. Also, so there is now big debates about, I heard that the Darmstadt Festival was subsidi get a subsidization from the CEA to show that the Russian way of dealing culture was not the only way, that Darmstadt was a kind of a s cultural organization in the context of the Cold War. So we have a lot of complot version about Darmstadt. So I still am very interested in experimental music because it just per pushed the limit of my knowledge of the instruments further. And I think uh, kind of, and we had here kind of 10 years ago or 12 with Bart Bukhart, the seminar about Lachenmann. Lachenmann learned me a lot about doing this perforation about what is a string. Are some people interested? That's another problem. But of course, you, when you spoke about uh, Martel, for example, in Haydn, intonation sounds for me more difficult than in Schoenberg. Because this idea of knowing how we place the harmonic uh, intonation with the relation with queens, what is the septim? Is that a septim or a double quart? So we have to build a grid which is, should be extremely uh, secure, even if intonation is not everything. And I think, um, personally, also a figure from the middle of the 20th century, or some also a person like Weinberg, and why, why Weinberg? Because it, I think it's an interesting music and it's less known. So you'd have less pressure of the thousand recordings already done about, for example, Shostakovich. And uh, at the end, there is a lot of composers still not played. Recently, we had two trio in Belgium. The um, Spieler trio record three trio of Desiree Pack, extremely interesting music from Liège. And on, on the other side, the trio Riland, who just record Riland and Kalatz. Kalatz wrote some quartets. Kalatz is a late romantic Flemish composer, and nobody knows him. And sometimes also to be in charge, maybe of a premiere, because some, I mean, premiere uh, was surely played in the past, but um, you completely understand your responsibility of trying to give birth again to this music and to find the information. And then the research is mandatory because you have no elements. So between the early classical music and for myself, I advise the Opus 1 and 2. Why? Even if the shape, I mean, the, is just kind of divertimento, but because then you, have, you can approach the stylistic question a bit later on. And, uh, piece unknown from the repertory of the two last centuries, Weinberg and new music sounds for me four good legs for my chair. Who is scared of playing Bach? Why are the hands not going up? Everyone is scared of playing. Are you not scared? <laughs> I'm terrified of playing. Okay, uh, who is scared of playing Mozart? Uh, of course. <laughs> Schubert, of course. Beethoven, of course. Who is scared of playing uh, Boccherini? Also, Dittersdorf? No one's scared of Dittersdorf. Um, you know, there is this, the, the, holy, the holy testaments, uh, 
we do have to get on and get get our hands dirty and accept our failings and we have to get in there and you can scratch out the name of Bach at the top of your music and write Vivaldi that will make you more comfortable and also Mozart just get rid of his name just you need to really be allowed to experiment and this idea of experimentation and finding your identity your musical identity new music I can highly recommend again is anyone here scared not about the rhythms but is anyone here scared of playing new music in that holy trinity type of respect no so get yourself some new music and cry your hearts out into this music learn to scream learn to shout through your instruments and lose that fear and find your identity and it can really be sometimes that a piece of modern music which allows you to go crazy you think gosh actually I've got something to say I didn't realize I was so scared I was tiptoeing around Mr. Bach I didn't know that I'm allowed to be me so that's I think an important part of also what Key is touching on music like Bach or Mozart as new, newly composed because uh, our professor has expectations they want us to have the structure they don't really ac accept the new ideas that we have so when we are in a string quartet or solistic or whatever our professor have an expectation from us when we play Mozart it has to be classical if we go away from this then it's wrong why it's wrong <laughs> And I, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I'm sorry, but whenever we are doing this and we are going a bit away from the normal, let's say, then we are wrong. But, you're, but you're when we are playing new, newly composed music, no one says anything. But you're the next generation. Yeah. You'll be the teachers eventually, but perhaps. I'm sorry, and I'm, <laughs> I'm getting this from these professors, and I have to learn this material. Yeah, and this is the technique that they are giving to me. So. Mm. What yeah. am I supposed to do? You have to split yourself into two and say, so well... I'm just doing this until I will finish my master's degree and then what? Yeah, exactly. Then why am I doing then this? Then you become personal. No, th this doesn't make sense to me. Why not? Mm. Because then I'm just losing my time to have a paper and then I'm doing what I really want that still will not be acceptable. Depends. It's, it's very frustrating. It depends how convincing you can be, how much you believe in what you want to do. Thing, yeah, but for me, this what you are saying approaches a little bit our question from the beginning. Yeah? If, if you, if you, how much do you have to stay close to what certain traditions expect? Present traditions, I say. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I understand yeah. that. And of course, it's it's a kind of school system where you have a kind of classical <coughs> instrument education. Yeah. Now with the newly composed, yeah. I really understand what you say. Don't don't see Bach. Please, something that you like. Yes, but no. <laughs> if yeah. I will do this and then I will really give my ideas on this, it's not acceptable. Yeah, but we have a hundred years of recording now. You can listen back yes. to the hundred years. You can see how things have changed and over a hundred years. And then will give another idea yeah. and then we are in the middle of everything. Yeah, mm. and then you move it on. You move on. You, you, you're young. You're going to go through your career. You're going to change. You're going to change other people. You're going to influence other people. I really believe that now, in this age that we are, we have to establish some things. And when we just leave everything in kind of way, like Mozart, this professor says this, 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 this. Okay, mm. we're somewhere in the middle, and one day we will decide. I really offer an advice, and I think I gave you the advice. Never play the same repertory for two teachers. And <laughs> it's, uh, <coughs> of course, it asks you to play more. And uh, we had the experience once, uh, I remember Opus 18, number six, the finale, the same week with Walter Levin and with the member of the Amadeus Quartet. Oosh. For Walter Levin, the finale of the Opus 18, six is the music of uh, Maniaco Depressive. Okay. He was a very interesting person and sometimes with strange reaction. And for Sigmund Nissel, it was a Bavaroise, so, and we had to play the game and it was extremely difficult and, but it's very difficult when if once you have in the same room because we are young we were accepting all the information we've got 
And I think when you meet someone, please take everything, because the real task of a teacher is to tell how to learn, not to teach. But if in your life you know how to learn from any situation, any person, you are saved. So it's why we were deciding when we met someone to say it's the truth. We don't make any judgment before we digest the knowledge or the teaching. And then we took our freedom, the kind of two steps. But on the same week, it's just a very difficult exercise. And if you have a student concert and they are both in the same hall, they both say they are bad because you choose a compromise. So it's why, it's why if you just change repertory, you play one Mozart with Walter Levin and one Mozart to Amadeus Quartet. You have two different experiences, and then you find yourself in between. But you do the exam for the two remembers. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there is groups that when we find out who is in the jury of the chamber music exams, we are like, okay, this person sitting there, we play like this. But yeah. can I say something, but really like, do this all exam matter so much, like in our musical no, but life? Like, it's just the scores that we get. We but that's the actual question. That's what I am asking. Everybody, every professor is different, wants different things. And then we are in the middle, just trying to understand what we are supposed to do. Yes, we have the scores, we have the material, but, but then you what? But you both finished this year, no? <laughs> 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 well, it's good, no? I uh, know. But Anse, I remember we spoke about this jury question. Yeah, because and I, I, I really, and I remember then saying you should absolutely not, you, you have to make your choice there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're now at the edge of, of, I mean, you just have to do one more exam to be a professional musician, let's say, or not a student, or I don't know what. Come on. I mean, I, I don't know. I think, I think it's a... <laughs> I think that I, because I sense a sort of lot of frustration. Yes, there is. And I think this is because there's this incredible game being played, this fine line between something external that has nothing that you are not in control of and something deeply personal to you. And how do you marry the two things together? I would ask, okay, uh, would you play, if you were auditioning for an orchestra, you know, we have to live in this world. This is the only place we've got, and you have to have concerts, otherwise you're just sitting at home. Um, if you were to audition for the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment and for the Leipziger Gewandhaus, would you play in the same way? You could, you know, because you know you won't get the job. That is a, a situation which is so extreme and very specific where I would say, it's okay. You know, you, I want a job here. I, I want to be part of your team. I want to be able to fit in with you. And I want to be part of your team. I have to know whether can I fit in with you. And I remember being, when I, the first, I had two days, with, when I joined my quartet, they, we tried out for two days, and I had a game plan. I decided, okay, how is this going to be? And I said, the first day, I'm going to play as I think they want me to, so that I can fit in. And that will teach me also, well, what, how many compromises do I have to make to fit into this group? And am I willing to make those compromises? This is a very important thing, this, which is relevant to you, the, the willing to compromise. Um, and the second day, my game plan was, I'm going to play as personally as I possibly, exactly as I need to. To so that they can see, oh, okay, well, where's that potentially going to take us? Is that interesting for us? Can we manage this? And, you know, is there a future? So I was quite extreme in, my, in, in, in those things. And I would say there's a... I would say there's a... Um, I don't think you should lose too much sleep about your exams. As you said, it's a school exam. It's okay. And... The truth of the matter is, I don't know, of course, any individuals that you're talking about, but I, I would presume and hope that every teacher yet feels passionately about certain things, but is at the same time when they're sitting in the hall being generous. 
because also there are multiple people on a jury and um, I, from my personal point of view, I, I need conviction. I need a person to, to sense that there's a personal truth being communicated from the stage and I need the craft. It needs to be you know, a technical ability. If those three are ticked, you could, I could hate what you're doing. But I will absolutely give you a wonderful grade because I acknowledge things which are maybe more objective in, in, a, in a way. And I, would, I imagine that many people are listening and like that. And I, I also think that sometimes the jury, I mean in our institution, like in the French institution, represents a part of the audience possible. And the most difficult audience is amateur players nowadays because they spend all their life with uh, wonderful recordings of the best one. And I remember once in a kind of little competition for Music 3, a trio playing wonderfully Brahms' first trio, and one amateur players, good amateur players, said, yes, but he missed two sheets. <laughs> okay. So, and uh, in the same time, I have to confess, uh, it stays between us, for the students I follow for a long time, I advise sometimes to play an efficient piece. If you play the eighth of Shostakovich, you will have good points. If you play Schubert Rosamond, you will have bad points. Bad points. Because it's extremely difficult, and some of my colleagues said, I remember once in the wonderful G major fantasy for violin and piano, which is one of the, and it's summit in the music of Schubert. Ah, there is not a lot of pesh. I say, but it's not the subject. Yes, but I need it. So I don't know how you should do with the violin and the piano to give kind of strong swing in this wonderful piece. So as you said, we are in a school and you can be clever and choose sometimes a repertory gives you points for three years. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say Shostakovich 8, which is a good piece, is not too dangerous in <coughs> an exam. And I agree totally with this exam today. That's, that's a little thing of the outer world you will encounter in some way. That's not important. But the teaching moment is very important. And if you en encounter these teachers who said you have to play like this, I don't like what you do. Did you ever ask why? Yeah. And because it's not the style. And did, did, did you get an, what, what the answer you, you got? Because it's not the style or because it doesn't fit? not what it's supposed to be. And did they explain the, something about the style? It is very around the, <laughs> <laughs> the real answer. <laughs> then the teacher has a problem, I think. <laughs> no, it's not about this. It's a, really uh, mostly about us, because we really want to know what to do later. We are uh, asking for some really specific questions that we have in our mind about our playing, about the style. We are taking for string quartets like Shostakovich or something, and we don't know how to practice it. We just have recordings. We are like, okay, I like this one. Let's try to, to put it like this. How? No one came to us and said, okay, Shostakovich is this, but you can play it also like this. It's okay. Hmm. It's always fixed. No, I would I would really you have to teach your teachers also a little bit. <laughs> and if you say why and you get an answer, this not a style. Then you just go further. Why is it not a style? What, what is typical about this style for you? Or where could, where could I read something about this style? And if still the teacher have, doesn't have an answer, sorry, he's not capable of doing it. I think there is an answer, but it's not enough for us as students. What, what would you need then, actually? It's, it's not about uh, the age that it was written, the, the period that was it. It's that as you said also, we are the new generation. We like this. We just want to play it like this. And we really believe on it, but there is always someone who will stop it because it's too much. That's what I wanted to say, that yes, we are the new generation. Yes, we want to play new compositions, but we are stuck with the old ones and we cannot do anything. <laughs> yes. yes. You're talking about the chamber music courses. No, not only, but generally, <laughs> we're stuck. No. So if you choose to play new music, they, they, you're, pre you're prevented, or you're not... Uh, if it is a new composition for us, it's much easier. Mm -hmm. 
because no one will say anything. Mm. Then I want really strongly advise, like you said, please go on playing your Kutak and your Lachaman and study your Mozart and your Schubert privately without me, without this thing. That's not the solution, I think. It's a solution. Because <laughs> I, I think. <laughs> avoid these people. No, no, no. no. It's not, not, not avoid it. the, the pieces. The name of Kutak was mentioned briefly about this beautiful G major. Um, I think, I think he, he should be mentioned more in the string quartet surrounding. Um, I think you learn more about Mozart personally. I'm not a string quartet, just a pianist. You learn more about playing some myths of Kutak. I think you start understanding more about praising in Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms by playing Kupak than by listening by like this piece you mentioned. I, I very, well, no, it wasn't conscious. I didn't want a pianist as a teacher, but the best musician that I knew was a pianist. There were two, Mr. Kurtag and a pianist called Ferenc Radosh, who was his great pedagogue in Budapest. He would laugh at us, at our stupidity. <laughs> he would roll around on the floor laughing. But like a very good lawyer, he would explain why this lacked logic, why this was wrong, what we were doing, why this kind of crescendo is not a Karyan Wagner, but it's a you know, that a Mozart is something different. And as I was speaking earlier, there are certain almost objective truths. This is dangerous ground, but you know, the relationship of harmonies, the structure of harmonies, the structure of the pieces, which you can say, okay, I want to learn. Tick, I can understand that. And it still allows me, if I'm desperate to vibrate the living hell out of every note, it still slightly allows me to do that. Or, I don't know, I'm giving childish examples. Or it, it still would potentially allow me to be very personal in aspects of my playing of, that are so personal, the vibrato, how you move your bow, how quickly and how smoothly, and all, et cetera, et cetera, how much variety you have. But if I understand with a good education certain fundamentals of structure and harmony, dissonance, consonant, um, then it allows me more space to still feel like a human being but I've had a good education. Mozart had a good education. Bach had a good, a good education. There are rules, there are structures that you have to be able to identify and understand. How does a composer compose? And then sing, sing as you need to. And so I would be questioning in my studies what, thing, what are things which are too subjective for me to be able to grow from what is here maybe more of an objective truth that I need to actually really do need to have in my pocket. Otherwise I'm, a, uh, otherwise I'm an amateur just enjoying myself, you know. Okay. So what do we, ob uh, what do we uh, identify as objective truths here? What is a normal phrase length? Eight bars. Wh if, it, if there's a tenth, b if there is a, a nine and a tenth bar, why? What is a normal structure? Uh, 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 an idea is, comes, has three parts and the third part is the answer, is longer. And, when, and, and why does a composer then maybe change that? Okay. Or... Uh, but so, so those are some objects, but there are other objective truths that don't come in into it, aren't there? Like the fact that you should never play a pair of slurred notes equally. <laughs> um, that's yeah. an objective truth of performance all the way to the 20th century, um, which we've forgotten. Um, that you have, when you have a succession of notes of equal value, you have to vary the lengths of the notes. You don't play them all equal because that's unmusical. These were objective truths until the 20th century. Mm. And then we have forgotten them and decided we don't right. believe them anymore. Right. And I think that's maybe why I was drawn to a composer and a pianist, because they don't know how to vibrate two notes. But they do, know, they do know how to make and them so unequal. Was, no, but <laughs> my point is that they were never, it was never a case of, oh, well, in our quartet we did this, or I, I would vibrate on all of those notes because it, it, it was a part of, it was something 
exactly what you're describing. I didn't receive bad information. Is yeah, they saying. can't do portamento either. <laughs> um, so, you, yes, I don't know. But they do play the chords together, what which is objectively not what people did until the 20th century. Who? Pianists. Well, which pianists? Not my pianists. <laughs> no, um, he played the chords together, I'm sure. No, 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 no. Nobody no. was allowed not to play the chords together. I think in Hungary you're allowed. <laughs> I think in Hungary you're allowed. Well, that would be pretty exceptional then. I don't know of any cases um, of that. I mean, I from the 1930s onwards, it was absolutely condemned not to play the chords together. This is possible, but uh, you know, there are certain people who are who are more enlightened or less enlightened, maybe. And I I know that we've all laughed, ha ha ha, when our you know our teachers told us about the famous letter from Mozart to his father. Can you imagine? They the don't Rubato. know. Yes. They <laughs> don't know in Mannheim how to play voices separately. And this is what we were taught from a young age. So, of course, this is we don't do this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose I'm trying to say... So, I mean, but it seems to me that accepting some objective truths and not accepting others is not very consistent. Which, um, which one am I not accepting? Well, the, the ones I've just talk, talked about. No, I'm accepting that you don't, them. But you don't do it. I, I don't understand. I was told... That the bass and the soprano must not or must not have to be played at the same time. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I don't do that. But you're told what? So, you don't so we don't do that. The bass is very most of the time comes ahead of the soprano voice, or if there's a gesture where the soprano needs to express something in an anticipatory manner, they she will play before the cello. Well, it doesn't sound like that when I hear it. I mean, I'm not talking about your quartet. Oh, no, but I'm talking about, my, to yeah. about me, well, well, because uh, of my education. Yeah, yeah but it isn't, it isn't what I hear in modern quartet mm. performances. Mm. Which, uh, no, 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 of course not. But then I think you're going to the wrong concerts. You know, <laughs> you, you're, I, I don't mean it. Sorry, that came in, I don't in any way. So you, you can imagine the jury discussions. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, what you're describing are things that you don't, in, uh, that of course are bad. Uh, that's, but I think what I'm trying to say is that not everyone in this world is poisoned and stupid. Mm -hmm. That there are people that can teach and talk about music in a way that totally respect everything, those points that you've made, and uh, have not fallen, maybe because they're pianists and composers, have not fallen into certain traditions, uh, bad traditions, and can speak about music in a way that allows you your personality but that nonetheless respects certain uh, aspects of how composers think in terms of structure, a surprise, and, and rhetoric and gesture. So, there is, it's, I mean, the situation is not useless here. But you have, to, you have to decide who do you want to study with. outside of a, a musician family and I can learn music and maybe historically that was less common and how does this influence how we play, how we play with others and I don't know, the, yeah. what do you think about if this has changed and if so, how does this influence then the result in the music? How does that influence them? The result uh, yeah. in the music, in the way we play or the way we play with other people. In general, in general, in general, in general because maybe if you were uh, born in a musician's family, you would practice your scales or your studies with your father accompanying you on the harp, and that changed the way we practice and play. I, and I, I didn't understand the second part of the. If that would influence the way we play, you mean if yeah. you if you come out the of this kind of social yeah. environment? Yeah. Of musicians and, and, and yeah. Hmm. When I speak for me, I, I I come out of a family where none of my parents or grandparents were musicians, but I started playing quartet when I was 15, and I never stopped. So <laughs> I don't know. It's difficult to say. 
Uh, if, you, if you're talking about traditions being passed on, I'm not sure that that happens very strongly because change is inevitable. We're always changing. Human beings are not content to remain the same and to do what their predecessors did. They always want to move on to something else. So, yeah, I think it's probably not very different whether you come from a musical family or not. I heard about a young person being from a musical family who was an extremely good pianist, went in the music conservatory music in Paris when she was 15, and she stopped the piano as we, when she was 18. So it was just kind of background which, which helped her to play, but finally she was absolutely not concerned. So I mean, somehow when you, I, I would say when you fall in the music, uh, you have a very good reason to be a musician. And as you said, I don't think it helps, or it, it depends. But we have also the other thing. I do it because my parents did it, and finally, it's not my job. I think a parent has done a good job, if, among other things, of course. But if you, if you leave your home and you have the confidence to, to know who you are and what, you, what makes your heart beat faster, mm -hmm. uh, and to be able to, to have the confidence to act on it. Um, you know, th this is something that is part of the learning process of growing up and becoming stronger and finding your, who am I and what, what have I got to say? Uh, anyway. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question in a way. I was talking more about uh, an actual musical result. If the way of learning in, in a place that I don't, but probably not, don't say that there is much of a difference. I think, I think that the effects of um, your environment are much stronger than your mm. upbringing. I mean, look at Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach and your Johann Sebastian Bach. Their music is totally different. Mm. And yet he was very proud of his father and he learned obviously a lot from him, but his music was entirely different. Yeah. I don't know. Some more questions? Not really a question, but more a personal opinion or something regarding all these recording things that we just talked about. For me, as a musician, I also consider myself a music lover, let's say it like this. And regarding this, I would say that I have, I listen to a lot of music. I would say, I listen to music for pleasure and music for educational reasons, let's say like this. And um, myself as a violinist and a historical violinist as well, I listen to a lot of first uh, half of the 20th century music recorded. So not, not composed in that area, simply recording from that period. And a thing that I really enjoy on those recordings that let's say later didn't happen, it's one take recordings. So whatever happened there, it's just, it's done. You cannot edit that. Yeah. And uh, I would say that from that you can learn a lot. I, and actually a lot of those recordings finally become the recordings I listen for pleasure, not only for a personal reason. Of course, it can start either one way or the other, but yeah, well, I don't know what, what are you? comment about this. I think you need to have a revolution start here uh, because against Deutsche Grammophon, you know, <laughs> against, against the editors, uh, the, the, the style, because I, you know, there's this lovely, uh, there's this wonderful recording of Opus 131 by the Bush Quartet, mm -hmm. um, where the fifth movement, you maybe you recognize. And you know this childlike running around the playground, this t -t 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 playing, pushing and poking, and there isn't a single note of that recording by the Bush Quartet that's together. <laughs> and God bless them for it. It sounds like children running in the playground. And I find that one problem that young quartets have today is, well, what do we do? You know, how can we fight this battle? It slightly relates to a little bit to what you're saying. How do I fight a battle when when all of the top selling recordings that most are, are edited to within an inch of their lives 
and have no degree of, of human frailty and failure in them, like these old recordings did, which you love so much. Uh, I can only say, be young and be revolutionary. You know, you should lead the way. Um, and I think there is room nowadays, a little bit more room than there used to be in the 80s. It was, you're either with Deutsche Grammophon and EMI or, you're, or you have or Sony, or there's no career. Nowadays, you know, the, de the, democra bleh, the democracy that's happened, everyone can have a career somehow now for, for good or bad reasons, but through, through the internet, social media, et cetera, et cetera, everything that's at our disposals, you can produce recordings now in a way much eas more easily than you used to. So I think if, there's, if your heart is in it, people will pick up on it. Have courage. I don't know. Experiment. But more a comment about uh, what you say that, um, on learning from recordings as well. So I really learned a lot and, and a lot. Listen, okay, as a violinist, I listen to a lot of piano music. And that influences myself a lot as a musician, I yeah, would yeah. say. Yeah. Really to give me new ideas to how to express myself and, and all these things. Um, and well, some people might say, well, yes, the first half of the 20th century, the sound is not as good. Well, I must say that the last 20 years, the sound engineers managed to remaster amazingly well. And more and more, there are new and new remasters that make the sound fantastic sometimes. Yeah. Well, I think also with that, we have more knowledge, don't we? And I think as young people, if you'd experiment slightly, I think as Clive is suggesting, well, for goodness sakes, do what you learned. Don't just line up your chords because the recording engineer wants it that way. Um, and if you can have that courage, and, and now that we know of so many more recordings from earlier, there are always more coming out, that you can actually say, well, no, excuse me, young man, uh, excuse me, Mr. Critic, or excuse me, Mr. Recording Engineer. That's what we want, that's what we believe in, that's what we're doing. And I think we live actually in a, an age which is a bit more forgiving than sometimes we think. Music conservative, conservatoires are very old-fashioned places. It's not <laughs> yes. the real world, you know. <laughs> I mean, for goodness sakes, blaze your trail, you know. Yeah, yeah that would be my advice as well. <laughs> OK, more questions, or shall we have a coffee and cake? And a lie down. But please uh, <laughs> feel yourself as important. And I remember once I had a quartet, a quintet playing Schumann quintet in, uh, and they felt so little comparing to this music. And I said, thank you, you are, you are the only one to play Schumann quintet today in Brussels. And if there would have been 20 Schumann quintets in Brussels in different neighborhoods, Brussels will feel better. So each time you play this music, you serve the city. And that you shouldn't never forget that you are important people. Thank you all. And maybe see you at 7 o'clock for, it's a long day, for the Quiron Quartet. You should. Yeah. The school said you should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to all of you.